Chapter 4 August 18th I have been hiding for ten years, but it wasn't until two days ago that I had to face the reason why. I'm scared. I'm a coward. I'm afraid to face the consequence of my mistake. And I'm afraid of the monsters in the dark. The ones Mom would tell me about under the blanket. The ones that made me run away that night. But when I bumped into a guy at school... No, that's not what happened. When that guy at school bumped into me... On purpose, it felt like being jolted awake from a dream where you've fallen off a cliff that moment right before you hit the ground. Trayden. He said his name was Trayden, and he had nice eyes and strong arms. He gets a dimple in his cheek when he tries not to smile, and he acted like he understood me, like he could see me. I haven't let anyone notice me, remember me, for almost ten years. My abilities as a descendant have helped me stay hidden, wrapping my light up inside myself so I'm invisible to other descendants and demons. I've isolated myself, and I've done a good job, but he noticed me. My concentration must have slipped, but somehow I don't feel like I can push him away the same way I do others. He feels slippery. That's not the right word, but I can't think of a better one. Still, I felt someone looking at me for the first time and it made my small world feel like a shrinking cage. There is a whole life out there and I've locked myself away. Maybe I deserve it. But he made a crack in my cage and now I'm tempted to slip out and see what I've been missing. Dad would have told me to get out there and live life. He was mom's guardian and helped tell the bedtime stories. Nothing brought dad more joy than putting a record on an old record player and pulling mom around the living room, dipping her behind the couch where my brother and I couldn't see, and making loud kissing sounds for our benefit. It was dad who told me about the daggers. He told the stories with his deep voice that vibrated through my soul like bass speakers turned up too loud. There were three original angels against a whole race of demons. Where the demons brought darkness and despair, the angels brought hope and light. Miracles as simple as lifting someone's eyes to the sunset. Miracles as impossible as bringing a loved one back to life. Angels moved among the children of Valde Novo and brought smiles and joy that protected the ordinary's life force from the hungry demon forms. I remember Dad picking me up, tossing me high and catching me as he told the next part. As he talked about Cato Phileas' jealousy of the angels who had been given his father's energy when he'd been robbed of his birthright. With his knowledge, he discovered that by using an element of the earth, black hematite, he could steal the angels' energy. Even writing those words made me shiver. I slipped out to the living room to grab an extra blanket. Pat always keeps extra bedding around never knowing when the next foster kid will join us, always prepared to make this place a home for a displaced child. My parents would have liked Pat, an ordinary bringing light to a dark world, just like the angels of the past. But no matter how much you prepare, or how much goodness there is, something always goes wrong, just like in the stories. Cato Phileas found a way to capture Samuel, the angel of elements, and steal some of his energy. Baldur and Adiona rescued Samuel and scattered the black hematite to the ends of the earth, but not before Cato Phileas used the energy he'd absorbed to create a way to kill an immortal angel. My hand is shaking so bad I can hardly write this. The memory of my dad, his love for life, the way he helped my brother and I ride a bike and plant a garden, and now he's gone. Descendants are not immortal, not the way the original angels were but it's very hard to kill us. Someone must have found a way. I can't bear the thought that it might have been me. It's difficult to understand the consequences of an action, just like Cato Phileas didn't understand that all things must remain in balance, and when he tried to create a single dagger, he ended up with two. One black dagger, one pure white. The white one was the accident a balance of all things to permanently scatter a demon essence. The black dagger, made of hematite, could end the life of an immortal angel. Trayden Nelson Trayden's moments between solemn slumber and wakeful awareness were torture. His fingers could almost grasp reality while his mind fought the pain, the crushing pressure, the lack of air, the dark void that pulled him toward the end. He woke with a gasp, His room came into focus slowly. 
his dreams slipping back into the shadows. He tried to close his eyes, but the sensation of drowning was too overwhelming. Chasing away any chance of sleep, the clock read 3.30 a.m. He stumbled into the hall to escape his room. He stopped as he entered the kitchen. The lights were on. His mom sat deflated at the kitchen table, her hand spread out over a map, a CB radio planted on the chair beside her. Her whole body said, not again. Trayden didn't know what Gabe did when he was gone, or why he insisted on teasing Abigail by communicating through that stupid radio. Trayden pushed away the urge to try and read more, some things he'd decided to close his eyes to a long time ago. Abigail looked up. Trayden read the pain etched on her face. Something lost. He wanted to change this for her, to fix everything. She jumped slightly when she noticed him. She wiped away the emotion and put on her everything is fine face. Even if Trayden had wanted to read more, Abigail had a mask. He walked past her to the sink. She folded the map, her movements a little too fast. She put the map and the CB radio in the kitchen drawer. You're up early. Did you have a nightmare? Trayden filled a cup of water but didn't take a drink. He didn't want his mom to see his hands shaking. Nope, just thirsty. He paused. There was an unspoken history of Trayden's night terrors when he was younger, but he didn't tell her about them anymore. He wanted her to believe he'd grown out of them. Everything okay with Gabe? Of course. He'll be home this weekend. Great. Trayden hadn't expected a real answer. There was so much left unsaid that the words could have filled a book. How about school? She always had to turn the conversation back to him. I still feel different, like I can't quite fit in. Trayden, the things that make us different? I don't want to be special. Trayden started for his room, but Abigail touched his arm, stopping him with hardly any pressure at all. I was going to say, the things that make you different are the things that make you important. Sometimes we don't get to choose our differences, but we can choose the impact we make. He took the water back to his room and shut the door. He sat on the edge of his bed, holding the cup with both hands as he brought it up to his lips, the water sloshing back and forth. It was just a dream. He wasn't a kid anymore. The water was a balm on his parched throat, and he gulped it down. He heard a cupboard shut and the shuffle of Abigail's feet across the floor. She came down the hallway. Her footsteps paused outside his room, and he imagined if she came in, wrapped him in her arms, and rocked him like she had when he was small, screaming and sobbing after a nightmare. Her robe would smell of roses and mint, and her voice would be soft, her touch warm. Drayden leaned toward the door, swallowing to keep himself from calling out to her, asking her to come in. He was the captain of the football team, a senior in high school. He was the one who needed to be strong for his mom, not the other way around. Her footsteps moved on, and Drayden lay on top of the covers, keeping his eyes wide open, checking the clock every few minutes, willing the night to go faster. He did not go back to sleep. When Trayden came back out to the living room, the memories of the night brushed off in the shower, his hair combed, his backpack packed, Abigail was already on the couch. Maybe she hadn't slept either. I can drop you off on my way to work if you're ready. Trayden shook his head. Jaron's coming to pick me up. He wanted to show off the new car his dad bought him. I guess it's pretty fancy. Jaron's dad was an example of the power of money. Trayden wanted that, wanted to give his mom a fancy car and enough gas to drive from California to New York just for fun. Summoned by the musical sound of his own name, Jaron Calavan breezed through the front door without knocking. He entered with a confident swagger, moving as if the world conformed to support him. He wore a blue collared shirt and khaki pants. His skin was dark brown, teeth white and perfect, and his hair black with short, tight curls. Abigail stood, coffee mug balanced in one hand. Morning, Miss Nelson. Jaron wrapped his arms around Abigail, giving her a full hug. Abigail relaxed, a few of the lines on her face smoothing out. Jaron stepped back. Are you ready for the ride of your life? Jaron said. The car came in last night. My dad special ordered it for all the work I did for him this summer. Kind of a bonus. I don't think a ride to school will be the ride of my life. Trayden tied his shoes, angry at himself for being too caught up in his own nightmare to think of giving his mom a hug. Let's see this new car. He stood up and pushed Jaron toward the door. Halfway out the door, Trayden stopped and stared. 
He let out a low whistle of admiration. A shiny silver convertible was cradled in the driveway. The contrast between the immaculate vehicle radiating in front of the plain Rambler house with a cracked, tilted driveway was painful. What is that? Abigail had stepped up to the door behind him and was staring at Jaron's car. Aston Martin DB9 convertible with a V12. Jaron shrugged. It's not the newest model, but she has less than 50 miles on her. There goes your last ounce of humility, Trayden said. Humility is overrated. Sometimes you gotta make a statement. And what is your dad saying with this car? Trayden meant it as a joke, but he saw a shadow flicker across his friend's face. Trayden turned away before he could read it. The last thing he wanted this morning was to say something stupid in front of Jaren. He had been stupid in front of that girl the other day. He'd hoped he could find her today and get a second chance. Abigail bumped Trayden's arm as she moved out onto the porch. That's a nice car. It's interesting. Where did your dad get it? Who knows? Some friend of a friend who buys cars but never drives them. Trayden felt a twinge of jealousy at the look on his mom's face. He wished he could get his mom nice things now but he would be able to soon, just on the other side of graduation. Jaron jumped over his door and into the driver's seat. Trayden opened the passenger door and slipped in. He swallowed the nervous anticipation that rose in his throat. He had a fear of cars that left him sweaty and shaking, but he was pretty good at covering it up. His heart jumped into his throat when Jaron hit the on button and the engine roared to life. Your mom's got good taste, Jaron said. She really knows how to appreciate nice things, unlike some people I know. Yeah. Trayden gripped the handle on the door. They hadn't even started moving yet, and he could feel the panic squeezing down on his chest. He focused on his mom, watching them from the porch. He almost slipped and let himself read her. There was something more than admiration on her face. He could see disbelief, confusion, something about a secret. Jaron put the car in reverse and accelerated with precision, controlling the car like he'd been driving race cars all his life. Trayden's stomach was left behind in his driveway. He swallowed, hoping Jaron wouldn't notice the pressure grip he had on the seat. He took a breath and tried to sound normal. This car will get stripped down for the headlights before you get out of homeroom. Don't worry about the car. Jaron flashed him a smile in his rearview mirror. It has a new security system, developed by my dad's company. I thought your dad owned an energy company. Jaron swerved around a garbage can, the wind turbulence throwing a plastic bag into the air and making the garbage can rock back and forth. Trayden turned his head so he could close his eyes without Jaron noticing. My dad's company does a lot of things. Research, development, technology. We've got some exciting projects in the works. Trayden didn't bother answering. He leaned back into his seat, opened his eyes, and focused on looking as relaxed as Jaron. The last thing he wanted was his friend to know about his illogical fear of cars, his anxiety when it came to driving. He was already different enough. He didn't need anything else that set him apart and made him look like a freak.